How about some breakfast? The most important meal of the day. Serving it up Gary's way. Pop! Enjoy, buddy. You cannot be for real. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. In life, we all experience pain, and it sucks to have to go through that pain alone. So, you see, I'm not feeling very empathetic today. So I'm gonna force all of you to share in my pain by witnessing one of the most despicable scripture twisting from a series called Scripture Twisting 101. Ironic. Today, our good friends, Brother Hassamo, Sheikh Marlena Mufti, Sister David Wood, and Al Fadi are gonna teach us about how Quran chapter 60, verse 8 is not tolerant and not calling for peaceful coexistence. Apparently, it's like one of the Ten Commandments of the Gospel of Islamophobia to make Islam look violent and stuff. Allah does not forbid you to deal justly and kindly with those who fought not against you on account of religion and did not drive you out of your homes. Verily, Allah loves those who deal with equity. David, mm -hmm. what is wrong with this verse? It's clearly talking about love, justice, kindness. Well, for one, there are plenty of other verses in the Quran which talk about kindness and justice. But I get that it's your job to make people think that there's only enough of those verses to count on one hand. The verse, however, doesn't mention anything about love, because love is just a feeling. Please, guys, for the love of God, no pun intended, do not make me go back down this road again. Well, I mean, one, you have, once again, you have to think about the level of desperation here, right? Yeah. Um, we point out verse after verse after verse in the Quran calling for the violent subjugation of Christians, Jews, um, polytheists, and so on. You find the same thing in the Hadith. And so when we see various uh, Islamic groups going around violently subjugating people, we point out the passages that lead to these things. And all of them are out of context or misunderstood. We're sick of refuting you on this. What's next, Quran chapter 9 verse 5? Kill the polytheists where you see them? Yeah, I know, you people love bringing that up. That was one of the first verses I knew about when I first started debating Islamophobes. One of many simple refutations to that is to read the verse that comes right after it. And we show these kinds of passages to people in the West who are claiming, oh, those aren't real Muslims who are doing exactly what Muhammad and Allah commanded them to do. No, those aren't real Muslims because, and chapter 60, verse 8 is one of the most common passages. It's a, a, along with Surah 2, verse 256, probably the one I see most to show that Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, notice what it says, though. It's, this doesn't command anyone to, um, to deal kindly and justly with other people. That's right. There's a condition. Yeah, he, he says, well, even then, he's not, he's not commanding you. He says he doesn't forbid you, right? So in other words, hey, I have family members coming and visiting me. They haven't subjugated me. They haven't attacked me. They haven't uh, criticized my religion. Um, can I be nice to them when they get here? Or do I have to just shower them with abuse and contempt? And here you have, no, you're allowed, you're allowed to be nice to them, right? It's not, hey, you have to be, you have to be nice. Command, it's, yeah. Allah doesn't forbid you from being nice. You have a choice. Keep, yeah, keep. <laughs> oh, really? It's just an opinion, right? Kindness, justice, and good conduct are just options. There's no way Allah would demand his servants to do that which is right to the people. He leaves bad conduct as an option and... Uh -oh. What is wrong with you people? Despite your decades in Islamic scholarly research, you can't seem to find some of the most basic morals being taught in the Quran. I mean, come on, you could have at least Googled it if you were being honest. Thank God for Sheikh Google. Oh, but wait, the Prophet said that you can be mean to non-believers though. Hold your horses, sister. I'm about to share some interesting sources for you. Narrated by Asma bint Abu Bakr. My mother came to me during the lifetime of Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him, and she was a mushrik. I said to Allah's Messenger, seeking his verdict, my mother has come and she desires to receive a reward from me. Shall I keep good relations with her? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Yes. Keep good relations with her. Hang on, I ain't done, Mufti Saab. I'm about to completely expose how little you understand about any of this. Imam Ahmed recorded that Abdullah ibn Zubair said, Lutayla came visiting her daughter, Asma bint Abu Bakr, with some gifts, such as dibab, 
cheese, and clarified cooking butter, and she was an idolatress at the time. Esma refused to accept her mother's gifts and did not let her enter her house. Aisha asked the Prophet about his verdict and Allah sent down the ayah, Allah does not forbid you with those who fought not against you on account of religion, until the end of the verse. Allah's Messenger ordered Esma to accept her mother's gifts and let her enter her house. Hey, I have family members coming and visiting me. They haven't subjugated me, they haven't attacked me, they haven't uh, criticized my religion. Um, can I be nice to them when they get here? Or do I have to just shower them with abuse and contempt? Allah's Messenger ordered Esma to accept her mother's gifts and let her enter her house. No, you're allowed, you're allowed to be nice to them. Allah's Messenger ordered... Allah doesn't forbid you from being nice. You okay, have a choice. Keep, yeah, keep... <laughs> Allah's statement, Allah loves those who deal with equity, was duly explained in the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat. We also mentioned the authentic hadith. The just, who are fair in their decisions, families, and those under their authority, will be on podiums made of light to the right of the throne. All of this is compiled by Ibn Kathir, someone you guys just arbitrarily appeal to when it's convenient. Here's what we learn from all this. Allah isn't saying that it is okay to be mean to them since he doesn't forbid kindness, you jahil. He's telling the companions that it is not forbidden for them to show kindness because they thought that it was forbidden to show kindness. All right, Sam, what do you yep. think about this? Another thing that the non-Muslims have to keep in mind, because non-Muslims do not equate, let's say, criticism as a form of fighting, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I criticize you, you may criticize me, but that's not grounds for him to pick up a sword and, you know, mm -hmm. chop off my neck or pick up a gun and shoot me, right? <clears throat> Islamically speaking, when it talks about waging war against Muslims, fighting Allah and His Messenger, Islam defines criticism of Islam, criticism of Allah, criticism of Muhammad, questioning whether Muhammad is a prophet, questioning his, his morality, questioning his lifestyle, questioning whether the Quran is from God. That's considered waging war. That's considered fighting with your tongues. And that's grounds for Muslims to attack, subjugate, and or kill you. And here's the proof. Prepare yourselves, guys. This is about to be the single worst and most disgusting display of cherry-picking and misquoting you've ever seen from these guys. I mean, if you've seen worse, then I challenge you to give me worse examples. Seriously, type in the comment section if you've seen worse than this, and maybe even give me a link to it. Chapter 60, verse 2. The same chapter of the Quran. Chapter 60, verse 2. Because what did 60, verse 8 say? That Allah doesn't forbid you from showing kindness to those who do not war with you. Well, hold on. Let's see what fighting or making war with Islam looks like from a Muslim perspective. Chapter 60, verse 2. Same chapter of the Quran. If they come on you, they will be enemies to you and stretch against you their hands and their tongues to do you evil and they wish that you may disbelieve. So it's not just physically attacking Muslims, it's attacking Muslims verbally, criticizing That's right. Muhammad. That's right. Saying Muhammad is a womanizer or a pedophile. That's grounds for Muslims to attack you. That's grounds for Muslims to kill you if not subjugate you, because that's considered warfare. First of all, the verse doesn't mention criticism. The very fact that Allah qualifies their speech as evil is a strong implication that is just the same kind of vile crap that we see from geniuses like you. You wicked prostitute of Satan. And I'm giving you the G-rated, because Christian's gonna get upset at me for calling you a prostitute. I don't mean to insult prostitutes. <laughs> We love you, Jesus. Second, how about you read the verse that came right before it? O oh, you who have believed, do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies, extending to them affection while they have disbelieved in what came to you of the truth. Having driven out the prophet and yourselves only because you believe in Allah, your Lord. If you have come out for jihad in my cause and seeking means to my approval, take them not as friends. You confide to them affection, but I am most knowing of what you have concealed and what you have revealed. And whoever does it among you has certainly strayed from the soundness of the way. Quran chapter 60 verse 1. The verse that Sam is reading is merely adding to this one, which is referring to a specific group of disbelievers, i.e. the pagans of Mecca, who forced them out of their homes. What really gets under my skin is that David Wood is already aware of the fact that the Quran says this because he commented on a verse just like this in a previous video. Permission to fight is given to those upon whom war is made because they are oppressed, and most surely Allah is well able to assist them, those who have been expelled from their homes without a just cause, except that they say, Our Lord is Allah. 
Did you catch that? According to the Quran, Muslims were kicked out of Mecca simply because they believed in Allah. We've already seen that the Meccans had no problem with Muslims believing in Allah or even with Muslims preaching Islam. They had a problem with Muhammad mocking their religion and causing division in their city. But again, Muslims needed victim status for their protection, so I guess Allah decided to fudge history just a little. Despite giving such a boneheaded commentary, here he is acting as though it doesn't exist. Shut him up! You said it, Sheikh. That's further confirmed by two other verses in the Quran. Yeah, watch here. I hope you guys' as Iman is ready for this one. Chapter 9, verse 12. Watch here. And by the way, chapter 9, we're going to revisit that that's a right. little later, and that's the last chapter that was supposedly composed by Muhammad, his final marching order, so to speak. Citation needed. Chapter 9, verse 12. But if they violate their oaths after their covenant and attack your religion, with disapproval and criticism. Notice, attack your religion how? By disapproving of it and criticizing it, then fight you, the leaders of disbelief. For surely their oaths are nothing to them so that they may stop evil action. So if I fight Muslims by criticizing Islam and disapproving of Islam, that is grounds for Muslims to attack me and or <clears throat> kill me. Unfortunately for Sami, the words with disapproval and criticism are not found in the original text. This is merely an addition from the Halali Khan commentary. Not only does the original text not say this, but neither does your other favorite commentaries like Yusuf Ali. In his commentary of this verse, he said the following, Not only did the enemies break their oaths shamelessly, they even taunted the Muslims on their faith and the simple-minded way in which they continued to respect their way of the treaty, as if they were afraid to fight. Now, notice something else here, guys, the word and being used. It's not that they can either violate their oaths or insult our religion if they want to incite war. Allah is merely adding up their crimes in a general sense and summing it all up. They did a lot more than that, Sammy. Now keep in mind that in two other places in the Quran, Allah tells us to debate with non-Muslims and the Ahlul Kitab in a way that is best. If criticism of Islam warranted the death penalty, Allah wouldn't bother saying this. But maybe it wouldn't apply to you guys, since I more or less consider you to be Ahlul Shaitan. Now, chapter 9 verse 32. They, and again I'm reading Halali Khan that provides explanation within parentheses, they, the disbelievers, the Jews and Christians, want to extinguish Allah's light with their mouths. That is to say, with their swords, with their war horses, with their missiles. No, with their mouths. They want to extinguish Islam with their mouths by saying Muhammad is a false prophet. He's a fraud. Okay, they want to do that. Kind of like what you're doing right now. How does this justify killing them for it? But Allah will not allow except that His light should be perfected even though the kafirun disbelievers hate it. So what's the point? Criticizing Islam is declaring war against Allah and His Messenger. And that's grounds for Muslims to attack you and or kill you <clears throat> and oppress you. Where does the verse say this? This is like taking a verse where the disbelievers say that Jesus is God and then somehow concluding that the hudud punishment for them is death. I mean, for God's sake, it even says Allah will not allow, showing that no matter what happens, God won't allow their actions to prevail in the end. It doesn't say anything about jihad. Chapter 60, verse 4. Indeed, there has been an excellent example for you in Ibrahim, Abraham, and those with him, when they said to their people, Verily, we are free from you and whatever you worship besides Allah. We have rejected you, and there has started between us and you hostility and hatred forever until you believe in Allah alone. Hmm. Right? And that's Abraham's there example? Yeah, so, so, so no, notice what the Quran does here, right? It lays down Abraham as an example and says, Abraham said to his people, to his people, Hey, guys. I preached Islam to you, you didn't believe me, and now there is hatred and hostility between us forever until you believe in Allah alone. If David or Sami actually bothered to read from the very sources of the Quran they're appealing to here, they would know that Halali Khan gives a footnote to a few other verses pertaining to this one, and each of them shed light on it and explain what's going on here. The latter two citations talk about how Abraham actually, very tolerantly, prayed for his father's guidance and forgiveness, despite his animosity toward him. His father even threatened to stone him in verse 1946. Also in the Quran, chapter 21, verse 68, 
as well as many other sources, it says that his people tried to kill him by throwing him in the fire. So no, guys, they were not rejecting them for their disbelief alone. But what about Ibrahim and his father? What exactly is Allah praising Ibrahim here for? Let's go to chapter 9, verse 114. And the request of forgiveness of Abraham to his father was only because of a promise he had made to him. But when it became apparent to Abraham that his father was an enemy to Allah, he disassociated himself from him. Indeed, was Abraham compassionate and patient. Ibrahim asked Allah to forgive his father, despite his animosity. Allah rejected this because it had been made clear to him that he died on falsehood as an open enemy to Allah. So the good example here is that when he realized that his father died in this way, he did not make dua for him or ask Allah to forgive him. This is what is meant by what is said in chapter 60 verse 4. Yes, the followers of the Prophet would always hate those who disbelieved until they became Muslim, or at least they would hate what they do and how they do it, but becoming Muslim is the only thing that can fix what they did. Furthermore, as far as Muslims are concerned, belief can patch up all prior bad blood the way we see it. The context of chapter 60 verse 8 then would have to be, wait a minute, does that mean I have to just shower hatred and hostility on everybody? How am I going to win someone to Islam if, if I can't you know, even be nice to them at all or something like that? And then the qualification comes in. Oh goody, David's gonna give us the qualification. Wait a minute, if you want to, if you want to be nice to someone for some particular reason and that person has never done anything to the Muslim community, has never criticized you in any way, you can, if you want. Yes, when Allah said to be kind to those who do not attack you, he was simply qualifying what he said before, which had absolutely nothing to do with what he said later. You crack the code and it makes no sense. So in other words, Abraham is declaring war enmity and hatred solely because they refused to embrace his religion. Yeah, nice try, Sammy. There's no mention of war. Let me just uh, give the comment from, because uh, yes. I had mentioned earlier that, uh, so notice we gave every benefit of the doubt. All we did was read the passage in context to show that, wow, if this is the best you've got, claiming that Islam is peaceful, and, and, and it's a passage where there has to be endless hostility and anger between Muslims and non-Muslims, that's what the passage is declaring. It's just saying, hey, if you want to, you can be nice in certain circumstances. Um, if that's the best, <clears throat> wow. But even that, yeah. even that one thing yeah. <clears throat> was abrogated, was abrogated by later commands to fight people simply because of their beliefs. So at that point, it, it's not hey, has this person done anything to the Muslim community? Has he persecuted you? Has he criticized your religion? It's just, does this person believe what you believe? And then they're, they're, once Surah 9 is revealed, they're supposed to fall back to that pattern that Abraham supposedly had, which is endless hostility, all we can do is fight, because until you believe in Islam. <sighs> Come on, let's hear it. I'm ready for the scholarship. But just let me give you the commentary of Tafsir Jalalain, one of the most respected Muslim commentaries of all time. I love how whenever you people cherry pick your commentaries, you make it out to be the cream of the crop. But when it doesn't suit your narrative, suddenly it doesn't exist. Never mind the fact that several other commentaries out there which you people use constantly will refute you on this point. And this is his commentary on chapter 60 verse 8. Allah does not forbid you in regard to those who did not wage war against you from among the disbelievers on account of religion and did not expel you from your homes that you should treat them kindly now watch what he says now this was revealed before the command to struggle against them in other words struggle is jihad yeah, that's right this is revealed before the command to wage jihad against them um okay where did he say that it was abrogated All right so notice what notice what he's saying here yes you were allowed to be nice in certain circumstances to people if they hadn't persecuted you, hadn't, hadn't uh, uh, criticized your religion. But this was abrogated by the command later to fight those who do not believe. You have to fight people based on their beliefs. That's wow! Right. Is everyone seeing how peaceful this is? Okay, first of all, you don't understand abrogation at all. Second, he didn't say that it was abrogated. He merely gave a freaking timeline. Let's imagine your logic of abrogation for just a minute. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created you. Was revealed before the command to fight in the path of your Lord. Conclusion. Muslims no longer have to read the Quran. Are you serious? 
Third, it being revealed prior to the verse related to aggression against the enemies of Allah does not mean that you cannot befriend those who are not the enemies of Allah. I can't believe I even had to say that. Fourth, I'm actually so glad that our friends here decided to go to Jalalain to prove their point here, most likely knowing full well that going to Ibn Kathir would have destroyed this video. It's so lovely. Let's see what Jalalain had to say about verse 1690. Indeed, God enjoins justice, that is, affirmation of his oneness, or actually being fair, and virtue, performance of the religious obligations, or that you should worship God as if you were able to see him. As reported in the hadith, and giving to kinsfolk, he has singled it, kinship, out for mention by way of highlighting its importance, and he forbids lewdness, fornication, and abomination with regards to the stipulations of the law. Abomination, such as disbelief in acts of disobedience, and aggression, wrongdoing against people. He also singles this out for mention by way of showing its importance, just as he began with the mention of lewdness. In this way, he admonishes you through commands and prohibitions, so that you might remember that you might be admonished. This verse is the most comprehensive verse in the Quran in terms of what is good and what is evil. Yes, buddies, your own sources are refuting you. Congratulations. No, but it's a, it's a peaceful religion, a tolerant religion, that goes out of its way to forbid its adherence from fighting anyone, and fighting is a last resort. That's what my Muslim friends keep telling me. That's what Shibri Ali tries to convince me of That's all right. the time. Hmm. Everything you just said was correct. Except you do need to make one little correction. You don't have any Muslim friends. We are not your friends. And we never will be. That's right. Okay. Gentlemen, may peace be upon both of you. Thank you. Until we meet again. I really hope we don't. Okay, we are done. Talk about scripture twisting. You know what I really don't get? If they wanted to draw Muslims to Christianity, they don't need to make Islam look barbaric. We could all get along just fine without ever bringing stuff like that up. Wouldn't they want Muslims and Christians to be able to live together without being under the assumption that one of the other group's holy places need to get locked down or monitored? If they just stopped with this, there would be no problem. I know why they won't stop. To Christian missionaries, anything that isn't Christianity must be made to look like the worst thing since Satan's creation. They don't care about how many lies they have to tell to get that far. But think about it for just a moment. The prophet was bullied, humiliated, was left helpless to assist his people from the torture and humiliation from the people who did this to him. Despite all of that, they conquered Mecca without persecuting a single soul. Even though every single person there deserved punishment for either directly or indirectly persecuting the Muslims, there's no way any other military leader in the same situation would have done the same thing. Definitely not these clowns. And who comes along to slander and ridicule him? An unholy trinity of ignorant cretins with too much time on their hands, and apparently nothing better to do with it except ridicule a man whom they could never even hope to halfway amount up to. Pathetic. Please, if you're fans of these guys, study Islam with an open mind. You can base your intellectual honesty off of honest research, or you can keep your confirmation bias and get all your info from experts like this. The choice is yours. Assalamu alaikum everyone. You're gonna remain sinful and dead because his blood, his life, is the remedy to purify you. <laughs> Look, ma. No hands, ma.